Welcome to The Digital Patient, where we discuss the latest advancements in digital patient engagement and share stories from the front lines. I'm your host, Alan Sardana, and with me as always is Seamless MD CEO, Dr. Joshua Liu. Today, we're joined by our very special guest, Dr. Matt Sakamoto. Dr. Sakamoto is an internal medicine trained primary care physician with board certification in clinical informatics. In his current role with Sutter Health, Dr. Sakamoto serves as a virtual first primary care physician and chief medical informatics officer for Sutter West Bay region. Dr. Sakamoto, Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Like I said, I'm a big fan of all of uh, Josh's posting, so it's fun to chat. And I think it's our first time chatting. We'll be actually on this podcast so people can watch it happen in real time. <laughs> yeah, both of that. I'm also a fan of your work as well. So thank you for being on board with this. Absolutely. And Matt, you've had such a unique journey in healthcare, I'll say, that really could have only happened for you here and now at the intersection of all your skills and interests and hobbies. And then the COVID-19 pandemic, you've really defined being at the right place at the right time. To start the conversation, I know in your bio, we mentioned your virtual first primary care, but you actually had an interest initially in biomedical engineering. So I was really curious what spurred that interest and then why did you end up in medicine? Yeah, no, great question. As you could tell, my career path has just taken many twists and turns and it kind of actually has actually gone full circle. Biomedical engineering, I think I did just because I was good at math and science particularly biology, chemistry, and physics during high school. So I was like, well, that sounds like a good overlap for biomedical engineering. So I uh, did, did, chose that as my uh, undergraduate degree, kind of went straight into it. Like the, like the first two years, and then the math got too hard. Like math yeah. stopped being fun. And I was like, oh, and I was like, oh, I don't see myself being able to do that. I thought I was going to do like more of a research career to start with. And then I realized like that was not for me. The, the big turning point was I actually did a, it was a research in, internship. I'm from Hawaii originally, <laughs> back home with one of the local hospitals. So it was meant to be more of a research thing, but I worked with a vascular surgeon, got to kind of see the way that she interacted with her patients. And I was like, oh no, I'm, I'm not going to do this research thing. I'm going to pivot. I'm going to go into you know, the pre-med track. Luckily, all of the biomedical engineering prereqs are pre-med prereqs anyway, so that shift was easy. Um, but yeah, that, that was definitely like a, that after that summer was definitely a clear move from, oh, I want to do research, help a lot of people. Oh, I really like that human connection piece um, that medicine uh, allows for you and kind of building those um, doctor patient relationships. But it's kind of gone full circle now where it's like, I want to try to make a bigger impact again, less through research or you know, finding a cure for cancer or whatever oh. that might, whatever I thought I was going to do and being, and just kind of do more, like, how do we scale care? So that really aligned with a lot of the virtual care stuff that I'm sure we'll talk about more shortly. Yeah, awesome. You're taking this focus now, looking at the bigger picture with data, but where did constructive complaining come into the picture and how did that lead you to informatics? Oh, so I, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, it was mostly just complaining as a medical student uh, that got me into it because not, not a lot of people knew what clinical informatics or informatics is. Uh, a lot of the work I did, uh, we would work as medical students in, in the primary care clinic a lot of typing, even then documentation burden was high. Um, and then we would do quality improvement projects to see like, how are our patients with diabetes? Are, we, are they getting their foot exams? Are they getting their eye exams? Are, is everyone getting their flu shots? But the way that we were extracting that information was us as medical students were going back into each individual chart and then like, abstracting that information and putting it into an Excel spreadsheet. And I was like, there's no way, like, why are we doing this? There has to be a better way. So I think it was just this pure inefficiency <laughs> I was like, why are we doing this? So I kept asking why. And they said, you should talk to the informatics folks. And we can kind of say that. Oh, and that, then that's when I started to learn there's basically a large backend database to the, to, the, to the side of the EHR, but you have to learn EHR anatomy and how to crawl through it, find it, get the right information, clean the, clean the data. So that definitely pushed me towards this informatics track was when I complained enough that they said, you should stop asking us. You should talk to these guys. It's so fascinating because I think, at least historically, most folks who end up in informatics maybe spend a number of years in clinical practice before they actually, I think, complain the way you did, and then eventually shift into the informatics. But it sounds like you were into this realm as early as medical school, and then maybe, I guess, it bled into residency, perhaps. And did you end up doing your fellowship immediately after your residency? Yeah, no, good question. And I got lucky. Like I said, I, I think I complained. Not, it wasn't even constructively. I complained to the right people and they directed me to informatics at an early stage in my career. Yeah, there's a lot of people that have been in practice for 5, 10, 15 years that are like, oh, I want to, now I want to shift into this. But yeah, Josh, to answer your question, I went straight through. I wish I'd taken a little bit of time to work just fully independently as an attending 
Um, but no, I went straight through from uh, undergrad to medical school. Spent one year doing a research year, uh, doing informatics during medical school, straight through three years of residency and then two years of fellowship. So yeah, there's some, there's, there were probably some things I missed along the way, but again, I, I learned from my colleagues who have been in practice for decades longer than I have. And so, so 2020 hits and you were just in the middle of completing near the end of your, your informatics fellowship, the yeah, pandemic, I was... problems, and then you go and create this virtual first clinic. Uh, can we talk a bit about like how you think about virtual first primary care? There's not too many folks like yourself who are, I'll call it virtual first, or I know the term virtual less is maybe growing. Like how did that come about for you? Yeah, I think I'll be honest, a large part is luck, right? So it's kind of a follow, follow who are the shiny objects are going clearly during COVID telehealth and virtual care and all the different modalities was a big boom. I think for me, I also really like the virtual care setup. One, it's scalable. That's the other thing too, because I've always thought about how do we do care outside of clinic walls. And f initially that was like data. How do we do pop health? How do we identify which patients to outreach to? And then I realized with telehealth and virtual care, you can actually provide care like outside the clinic walls to patients directly. So I think one is just the, the scalability, Im improving the access for patients. And then selfishly, personally, it feels like I'm kind of redoing parts of medical school. Like it's relearning the physical exam or how do you take listening to lungs where we would auscultate um, and you know, put the stethoscope on a chest. And then like, how do you actually find proxies for a virtual physical exam, you know, visual a lot of uh, trusting the patient to report their symptoms and signs. So I think for me, it's been a fun, just kind of like relearning to say, okay, like this is how I used to do it. I'm used to having a pulse ox. That's not an option anymore. Uh, so how do we get to, to some of this information uh, more organically, just kind of through talking to the patient themselves. It, and could you be able to for us a bit, like there's a difference, I guess, between being virtual first versus let's call it brick and mortar first and virtual is kind of this add on, which is probably the case for most um, clinicians at this point, what would you say are the biggest differences in operating a virtual first kind of approach or, or clinic? I think part of it is it's simultaneous clinician and patient education at the same time. So a specific example I'll give is I've stopped referring to the yearly check-ins with my patients as an annual physical, because that yeah. notes like you have to come in and be physically present and we'll perform a physical on you. So I call it like an annual wellness visit, whether they're Medicare or not. And it's like, this is my time to check in on you, see how things are going. I'll order some blood tests. And for the most part, that kind of helps me figure out risk of whatever else. And most of these patients, they don't exist in a bubble. I work in a large integrated, you know, delivery network. So they're seeing their cardiologist or they're seeing their OBGYN. So someone's performing a physical exam. Like other people are doing it. I trust my colleagues to catch things. So yeah, it, it's a different ethos to be like, oh yeah, just message us first. The one other thing I'll say is it's hard because every other almost every other clinician is like for the love of god do not message me like i'm dying in my own <laughs> basket we're flipped it's like that's an, another way to scale care we've realized that when you do a video visit or phone call that's one-to-one -one time that's spent for either my time nurse's time or uh, advanced practice practitioner that's working with me so when you message you can actually distribute care between the care team um, so patients it might take maybe longer over the course of a day but because you can batch the work and distribute the work. We try to turn as many things into not even virtual first, but um, messaging first. Um, so I've never experienced as a patient being cared for by a virtual first kind of care for team. So does that mean that as a patient, I'm not necessarily only having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you asynchronously through messaging, but is it more that like I'm async communicating with my primary care a virtual primary care team and I may or may not be interfacing with you versus an NP versus a dietitian or someone else. And it's more like your team is deciding like which provider is best suited to addressing this concern. How, how do you actually coordinate all that communication async? Yeah. With difficulty, but yes. And, and I, <laughs> so I describe it to patients and, and as I'm prepping my team, like we are the patient's care team. It's not, I am the patient's doctor. And I think that's the other piece that has really won. I've lo absolutely loved working in this model because yeah, uh, a, a doctor that has to handle their own in basket by themselves is just getting crushed by it because they are the sole person. They're the sole choke point of information coming in or out. Ours is the, the work gets distributed and I sign all of my messages back to patients like, you know, take care, Dr. Sakamoto and the connected care team. So we, we I, always kind of say like, and, and then when I have like my first visit with the patient, I'll often say like, you'll be hearing from lots of different people. There's myself, there's our 
there's our medical assistant, but just so you know, we're all on the same team. So that's the messaging that I give to the patient. In the background, the upside of working from home is we get to work from home. The tough part about working from home, and this is a um, huge boon during the pandemic, I kind of got to cut my skills on this at a bunch of different places, is how do you recreate what I used to be able to just shout down the hall when, you, when you're physically separated and, and we're each in our own apartments? So I've used everything under the sun from Slack to Microsoft Teams to like, there's like some proprietary stuff that we were using at UCSF. So like every HIPAA, and it has to be HIPAA compliant mm-hmm. because we're talking about, we're coordinating patient care. So the end-to-end encryption for everything else also has to be, you know, patient privacy secure. So it, I call it kind of recreating that back office. So things that I used to just like turn to the left and be able to say, hey, can you schedule this patient? And now has to be typed and, and, and routed around. So Yes, we've made it work, but it's a lot of lot of communication and over communication in on the back side between the clinical team, so that it, for the most part, tries to look seamless for the patient yeah. on, on the patient side. So yeah, a lot, lot of check ins, huddles, things like that. And then I guess from just setting clear patient expectations, I guess one of the, the things that comes up sometimes, like for example, like if you know you and I were to text a saying, you know, text can be free flowing; it can happen at any time of the day, right? So. How does that work with setting expectations for patients? Because, you know, as a patient, I may not be thinking about how Dr. Sakamoto, you know, probably shouldn't have to respond to my note at 2 a.m., right? But when you have an async line of communication, sometimes the the boundaries get a little bit blurry. Like, how, how does that work? You have to set certain, like, times of the day or, or do people just know, hey, I'm not going to respond to the next business day? How, how does that work? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we, we set clear expectations. So basically we're on, we clinical team, right? Myself, um, nurse and nurse practitioner are on eight to 5 PM, uh, on weekdays, uh, on weekends, we're not checking messages. So, and, and we tell the patients that kind of up front is sort of the, Hey, like if you message in, so we, we don't say like, Hey, if you message in, like we can take three to five days to respond, which is what some systems <laughs> set up and have as their like uh, on their banner. So we tend to like respond within one to four hours, definitely by end, end of a business day. Well, but we tell the patients like, hey, we, we checked our in-basket during business hours. You know, I trust you. If you think this is an emergency, like go to the emergency room, right? Like there's there's things that you might need. But if not, like the patients know that even if they message at, at midnight, we're checking our in-basket somewhere between 7 a.m. and 8 a.m. the next day. So if, even if there's like a urgent medication refill, they trust and we gain that trust and fulfill that trust by like responding back to them the next day. So I think some of this mismatch happens when sometimes a doctor may respond to a patient, like, because for better or worse, sometimes we're on our laptops at 10, 10 PM. (laughs) So if a patient messages in at eight and the doctor responds at 10, the patient is like, oh, so sometimes my doctor is around at 10 in, in the evening. So I think we set those expectations pretty clearly. And then actually the nice thing about Epic and, and just messaging in general is if I have time or if I need to, I'm looking at my stuff in, in the evening, but I'm post-dating my messages to mm-hmm. not send until the morning. Yeah. So the patient mm-hmm. has the impression mm-hmm. that we're prompt, but not like ultra prompt. <laughs> so it's these tiny things, but I think there is a, I think of it as a, as, as a fair bit of kind of patient re-education where it's like, hey, you don't have to wait to call. Uh, I want you to reach out when, when we can, but just know that we're only actively watching and responding in these in, in these hours. You know, so one of the questions you probably get is around, like, how do you make the business model work? Because you're not, I guess, you know, billing, you know, necessarily fee for service for an inpatient visit or even a, a live synchronized video visit. So does this only work well if you're in a, you know, an, an ACO or some value-based care arrangement or how, how, how do you make virtual primary care work from a, I guess, business model point of view? Yeah. And, and flipping it around, actually, the, I probably should have led with this, but the way that we describe our connected care clinic is sort of what we call it, is it's a value-based, team-based, virtual-first primary care practice. And it's in that order. So actually, the value-based part drives all of this. So all of the patients on our panel are Medicare Advantage, commercial HMO, a little bit of med- Medicare shared savings. But there's some sort of thing where it's not the number of visits that we're doing that drives this. It's the total cost of care that we're trying to drive down, quality metrics that we're trying to drive up, avoiding ED visits, those kind of things. So that's the the value piece is what drives all of this. It just happens to be that virtual is the most efficient way to get value because we're opening access. We're saying like, hey, if you have like a concerning symptom that you might have gone to the ED for, please message us first and let's see if we can handle it. Yeah. So that, yeah, it, it, it's, it, it works from, by being value-based on the front end in a way that 
this would fly in a, a purely fee for service setup. Amazing. And I guess, do you, do you still, and sorry, I asked one last question, Alan, because I know we have this whole schedule we might get, get back to with that, but like, I'm just so curious. So I guess you, you still have the, you still have the brick and mortar at UCSF where like some percentage of situations you do direct people in person, or is it more that it truly is like virtual person only. And then if there isn't in person, you're directing them to some other separate, like, I don't know, urgent care or some other. Center. Yeah. Good question. And I'll kind of compare and contrast this with like a couple of my like prior working experiences. So previous to this position, I was with Plush Care. So they're a virtual only, but all 50 states primary care practice. So for that one, yeah, that was purely virtual only. And then if they needed to get directed in, I'd kind of like Google search, basically be like, hey, this is your nearest urgent care. And I didn't like that quite as much. Like the reach, again, the, the scale was great because like between the different docs and our different licenses, we could cover all 50 states. But there wasn't that connection and trust and like kind of full loop thing where it's like, I couldn't say with confidence, like, oh yeah, you should go into this urgent care. I'm going to call report to Dr. So-and-so or whoever you're going to be seeing. So like, you don't have to retell your story. So there was kind of that gap and that disconnect when it was virtual only. Now with the, the current practice and the nice part about being part of an integrated delivery network is, you know, we're a primary care practice. I have colleagues that are in office. I'm actually in office one day a week. So like there's one day a week that's set up where if patients need to be seen for things that we can't do, like they can see their, their team. So that, that part's there and embedded, but there are, you know, we also have urgent care scattered throughout the Bay area and other places, and we're all on the same EHR, right? So like whatever conversation I had with the patient, even leading up to this, that's all visible. And they, and you know, when the urgent care doc sees them, they can just kind of hopefully pick up where, where we left off. And it's not like you're at a. I mean, I'll use trade names, I guess you're at a teledoc and you're sending them in, into an urgent care. And then you're the doc there's having to start completely from scratch for to, you know, to pick up on, on the patient's concern. And to your point, because you are a value-based care kind of set up, you, you're, you're incentivized to make sure like you're not, you're avoiding a serious use of higher cost services anyway. So that makes a ton of sense. And sorry, sorry Alan, let, let's get back. <laughs> oh, yeah. Looks good. Yeah. One really cool parallel that I noticed, Matt, um, a lot of the first CMIOs out there were kind of thrown into the deep end of setting up the EHR and figuring out, you know, documentation and all that. And you were kind of thrown into telehealth in the same kind of manner where it was brand new and you just had to kind of figure it out for yourself. One word that you used a little earlier was over communication when you were talking about back office stuff and how do you make sure that, you know, everybody's on the same page. And I think that word's really important for this next topic. You've talked at length uh, in the past about digital empathy and the need for connection, especially with virtual care with patients. And so I'm just curious to start, like, how do you define digital empathy? Yeah, I, I think it's basically, you know, basic empathy principles of understanding what someone else is going through. And actually, this is a learning for me as I started to dive into this a little more deeply is just traditional empathy is understanding how someone else is feeling, but then actually acknowledging to that person that I understand how you're feeling as well. So there actually is an active part um, of empathy. It's not just passively getting what's going what, what's going on. So I think that's number one. And then number two is just the extension of that digital empathy is playing that through some sort of technological means, right? It's not, you know, you can't put a hand on a shoulder or a comforting touch. It, it has to be through words and or, you know, just visual actions if you're doing it uh, through video. So yeah, so good. in short, digital empathy is like traditional empathetic things, but conveyed through some 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 distance yeah, through through some technology right and and so when we're talking about chat based telehealth for example what are some of your checklist items or tips that you have for virtualists out there or clinicians that are getting into telehealth how do you optimize digital empathy over text yeah a lot of it it's, it's more is more is sort of what I've, I've been telling people and it's not volume of words but it's checking in, confirming, and it's actually funny kind of as we've sort of dubbed the digital empathy, like 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 1.0 is the video visit, right? Cause we're, it, it's live. I can see some of the nonverbal cues people can nod. So that's sort of, so first, some of the first work I did, I worked with a patient advocate on kind of saying, how do we, how do you connect over video visits? So that was like the new thing. Then what's, you know, one level down, you, you take, it's audio only. How do you connect and and now it's again, you don't have the nodding or the verbal cues. So it's, it's, it's just checking it. So it's, it's, it's looping. It's being able to say like, oh, pausing, you know, did you understand that 
and then yeah, sort of the the, the digital empathy, I guess we're calling it two point of sorts, is for messaging. How do you how do you do this? How do you connect um, with, with patients? I think a lot of it is same thing. It, it's always just checking in. I focus on clarity of language, so I try not to use you know shortened either pronouns or you know not not a lot of this or its or those. Like well, saying specifically what you want to need. I, I tend to be a lot more specific. I think let's put it that way, and that that just is is part of the communication and improved communication piece. And just making it personal. I think that's the other part too, is I'm on Epic at, at, at our shop and a lot of people use standard dot phrases or like stereotype phrases. Like patients can tell when you're sending the same message to everybody. And, and so I think putting a personal spin on each one, again, it's a little more inefficient, but like for us, we need to build trust in patients for doing message based first, you know, messaging us first. So we try to spend a little bit of that extra time personalizing on those initial outreaches so that patients feel more comfortable messaging in and, and don't feel like they're just getting an automatic auto reply basically well, from us or the nurse. You know, one of the things that strikes me as you're describing this is in, in most aspects of medicine, you can look to the previous guard to kind of teach us how to do things. So even, even, even though telemedicine is, let's call it newer for a lot of folks, the last couple of years, you know, you're still speaking to a patient verbally. And so even for folks who weren't as experienced in telehealth, trainees and a younger clinicians can still learn from their mentors how to communicate verbally with the patient, whether it's through video or in person. But when it comes to chat, I would say a lot of you know our mentors of the old guard didn't have to use chat-based conversation with patients. And in fact, probably a lot of them, if they're if they're you know older, chat you know text and you to them than the younger folks, the new generation that basically grew up texting all the time. So. I wonder, like, have you experienced the case where actually a lot of our mentors, frankly, can't really teach us that much about how to do empathetic, you know, chat-based communication with patients? And in fact, sometimes you're having to teach the previous generation how to do this effectively. And I'm kind of curious what you've seen. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I think even with video visits, right, there's, there's certain things where it's like how to have empathy through just conversation is one thing, but like how to do a virtual physical exam. Again, these are things that I was sort of like, teaching myself slash texting with friends or sort of cobbling together best practices um, during the pandemic. Um, so I think for any of these things, uh, once you introduce technology, there is a skill curve to kind of have, have to climb. But that being said, we one of the other terms for digital empathy, we've kind of called it website manner. And it's like, like you had <laughs> a doctor that had good and bad bedside manner just in a purely like physical realm so the same way i'm sure that there are doctors that like would even back in the day like handwrite notes to patients or like kind of like you know if there's uh before electronic records existed like people would send either call and or mail patients their test results right and if they needed to put a little bit of a interpretation i'm sure some docs would handwrite it and then send, you know put it in the mail so i think there are doctors of the older guard that are good communicators via written messages i think it's the speed at which both patients, to be honest, and clinicians are trying to get used to, that is, is the differentiator, is just creating enough time to craft a good message. So it, it's less, I mean, there, there are like little tips and tricks, but like large parts of it is just having the time to think and, and send a send a well-crafted message to a patient than any specific skill. And I will say the nice part about our setup is like, I actually have, except for the days that I'm, I'm in clinic with like blocked time with like, you know, patient visits, 30 minute blocks. My Tuesdays, my Thursdays are, I'm providing patient care, but it's all just patient messages. So like with each one, it's not like I'm trying to jam a message out to a patient in between seeing patients physically. My day is devoted to managing the in-basket with, with, with the team. And that's a, another big difference. I guess, yeah, there's no specific skills I have. I just have more time than the average uh, clinician to read and respond to messages. So serious question now, emojis. Is it a problem? <laughs> Is it appropriate to use emojis in async chat communications with the patients? I'm curious, yes or no, and why? And if it's yes, like, is it more effective? Are you finding you're communicating better with patients? Yeah. What role do emojis play in async chat with patients? No, it, 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 the, like le legitimate question. The short answer is we actually don't, or at least so far as I can tell, I don't think Epic, you know, my chart messaging supports emojis so far as I can tell. I mean, you can like make like the colon with the, you know, <laughs> parentheses, they say you, you, you could do like the oldest school emojis. So those I don't think are available yet. That being said, there were a couple of places that I worked at previously that their chat featured function did support it. 
I actually had a whole, let me, if I can find it and I can share it in the show notes, there's a whole thing where there's like a generational difference in reactions to emojis. I mean, like, like Gen Z doesn't like the thumbs up sign out of something about that. I'm millennial for what it's, what it's worth. They find the thumbs up sign to be passive aggressive. <laughs> like, so there are differences and just generational differences on how, um, emojis are perceived. I, the short answer is I, I would actually support it for two reasons. One, there's a way to convey emotion, I think, right? That, uh, I mean, it's emoticon is part of there, right? So there's a way to convey emotion that written words can't do in and of itself. The other one is actually patients can respond hey, almost in like, like Slack or social media. There was a whole thing on Epic, my chart messages, where at one point they were suppressing when a patient said, thank you, because that's like, sure, it's, it's an hey, acknowledgement. Okay. It's a gratitude, but it also just acknowledgement. So it's like, but that was thought to be adding extra messages and burden to the clinician in basket. Could the patient actually have like a thumbs up or I guess like the prayer thank you hand emoji that would just go underneath a message. So that way the clinician could see it, see that it it got acknowledged, but it's not generating another full another like note or message that ends up into their, um, their clinical inbox. So, um, I think both for decreasing like notification burden as well as, but still conveying some of that information. So anyway, I'm, I'm very pro emoji for what it's worth. Me too. <laughs> but that's it. The the point you made about the generational differences, that is really fascinating. And that makes a lot of sense. That's really neat. But on the topic of, of empathy, so you know, I think you, you, you probably saw that that study that came out earlier this year about I think I know there's some controversy over how it was done, but the one where I think they they you put a chat GPT to send to kind of draft responses to patients and they compare that to what physicians on Reddit said how they would respond by butchering the design. I know it wasn't a great design, but it, it, it kind of makes me wonder if if we can use generative AI to help clinicians communicate empathy more effectively in their responses, even if the clinicians may not authentically really be feeling that way, is that still good? Should we care if that empathy is authentic or not as long as it helps and, and, and generative can maybe make it easier to communicate that? How do you think about that? Yeah, I'm 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 pro that as well. And I think even if it's not genuine in the moment, I think there is actually like a learning that can get embedded in the clinicians to be more empathetic just by like reading and slowly internalizing that. So it's it's actually the 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 computer is actually starting to kind of model behavior. I will admit, so what I actually run a lot of my things, this is not for patient messaging, this is just for kind of internal you know, business messaging, is I will draft an email and then drop it into one of the large language models and be like, can you please rewrite this to, what are some of the prompts I've given it? I said, I think I've said like, please rewrite this, like uh, using the principles of humble inquiry, please Oops. rewrite this uh, to highlight a call to action. Like, so like, I'm, I'm actually like using this again more in my business life, but I think that can hundred percent hold true for patient facing messages as well. So yeah, I, I think there's, there's a little bit of learning just as a sneak peek, or I've, I've seen this go through in some of the Epic systems. So you're right. The first study, again, it's harder for a doctor to be empathetic or show more empathy on like a public forum, right? So that, that's one, that's, that's one setup because I was on Reddit. What's happening though, is Epic does have drafting of responses to a patient right. in a doctor, you know, one-to-one private doctor communication. And that's gone live at a couple of uh, institutions. So I'm actually interested to see how that works out, rolls out. I'm pretty optimistic. I, I think cause any anything that can you know decrease the clinician workload is is, is helpful in and of itself. Um, hey, can yeah. I ask you from what you know about some of those initial pilot efforts with generative and in, in the physician uh, messaging? Is it that like as a physician you get to choose the prompt like write this in a more empathetic style blah 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 or is it more like it's, it's a can of the prompts for, for the types of tones or that you can kind of choose from yeah that good question sense. yeah it does at the individual clinician level i don't think there's reprompting you kind of you get what you get and then you yeah. again obviously you have the uh, ability to edit it before sending it out but at the institution level you can uh tweak the prompts so there is, it's not just like you get what Epic gives you. There, there is the ability at an institutional level to play with that. So that, that's actually, I'm, I'm most interested in that piece to kind of see how different institutions choose to um, make it longer <laughs> for, for those pieces. 
there's probably yeah. gonna be like a scale of like you know we need this to have you know like a lower literacy level <laughs> or, or you know you can like you can wind that a certain level or to your point you can maybe wind up the empathy and there's i guess yeah i'm curious too how different institutions will move those those like those dials mm -hmm. and honestly probably most will end up in a very similar place yeah and then probably are going to share their eventual like parameters with all the other institutions it's probably going to be i'm going to call it optimal it's probably some common point everyone gets to that that works pretty well like as long as it's better than what we currently do i think people are going to be pretty happy this yeah. not be perfect it'll it'll be some uh, it, it'll be some regression to the mean <laughs> what the collective that's a smart way of <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> um the other actually the other thing that I, I am excited for and interested to see i haven't seen anybody actually put this into play but whoever's listening feel free to steal this one is doing sentiment analysis so from the based on the patient's tone and like level of emotion going in do you actually provide a different prompt and no. response if someone's coming in hot <laughs> versus okay. someone that like seems like they're sad? So and I, I think like this idea of like sentiment analysis on patient messages inbound, can that also actually be fed into the prompt essentially before yeah. response? Yeah, that's a great, great point. And definitely, I think that would make sense. When we were talking about emojis earlier, I was wondering, would the answer be if the patient used the emoji first, then we can use an emoji or you know something like that. But that totally makes sense, feeding that input into the LLM. I'm really curious, just kind of expanding on this idea of generative AI and where it could take us. Do you think that there ever could be a situation where it's completely autonomous, chat-based AI physicians that are replacing yourself, at least through the the text message in your lifetime? I think there's portions, right? So uh, are they going to get rid of doctors completely? No. Are there things that I think can be automated? Definitely. So I think portions of the job will, will be automated, right? There's a lot of things that are already like semi-automated, like writing a prescription, right? Before I'd have to like get out a pad and write out the full drug name and how many, you know, whatever else things. Now I just have to know like what drug may be put in, how, how many pills I'm dispensing even then that's like auto-filled. So there's portions of my life that are already semi-automated. I anticipate slash... Uh, embrace the the, the paperwork-ish, administrative-ish portions being taken over. I'll be honest, I think even initial intake for some of these things can be done by patient, by, by, by chatbot. One of the companies I work with does this. It's like a good symptom checker, patient triage, and all of that is done fully autonomously before then, you know, heading off to either tell them to go to urgent care or do a video visit or go to the, go to the ED. So some of this stuff is already happening in terms of taking that, you know, that, that initial intake part could be probably chat baptized. Yeah. Do you think we could get to the point where, and I think part of it too is as a, as a physician, you still feel like you want, there's something important about you having that connection with the patient, but, but what if like eventually you could train a conversational AI physician agent in the style and the personality of a Dr. Sakamoto. So, you know, it, it's almost like it, it is you. It's the closest thing to you. Like, do, do you, would would you ever be comfortable with that concept at some point if it was reasonably good enough, safe enough? And it's it's kind of you. <laughs> you know, wildly, I'm gonna say yes. Uh, I don't know if this is like a hot take or not, but I would actually be okay with that. And the reason is, I'm kind of making a parallel to how we do our team based care, right? The APC, you know, the advanced um, practice practitioner that I work with we work to have like a seamless experience so that if they're getting you know if he's responding or if i'm responding the patient should kind of get like a similar vibe so obviously like he's not, you know i'm not molding him to be exactly like me but i'm kind of already like offloading some of the stuff that i would do and or duplicating some of the stuff that i would do and you know sharing it with a team member so if an ai bot is a team member that can provide that same level of responsiveness probably higher level of responsiveness oh. probably higher level of empathy than i could I'm okay with that going into play. I think the biggest thing, and this is why I don't think it'll, anything will be automated in the near future, is primary care, 90% of it is like pretty routine. Like you could throw it into a bot and <laughs> have it roll, right? It's like, if this if this urine test, then, you know, the, and, and these symptoms, then prescribe or don't prescribe. So it, it can be turned into an algorithm pretty easily. But 10% of it like kind of requires deeper thought. The hard part is no one has figured out like how to, define when those 10% of the time is. So until we do that, you kind of have to have a human in the loop for each one of these steps. So anyway, I think my job is secure. Our jobs are secure. 
in the short term for that. Because like I said, people look at it and most of the time, even like, you know, 90% of my day, yeah, I could 100% put this into a, a, a bot and have it do the same thing. But it's that spidey sense that like, oh no, I need to like go in a different direction. And if you make that fully autonomous, you're not going to catch those. Oh. Yeah, it's one of those things where also like in any other industry, you can be wrong and it's probably okay. But in this industry, if, if you're wrong about that 10% of the time where you really need the human to loop, then the consequences can be pretty catastrophic. And then you're, you really wish that, that you were there in the loop. So as you know, the, the risk threshold is just so much higher and, 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 and understandably and appropriately so. Because it makes me think about all the other industries right now where there are conversational AI support agents where it's like, yeah, you can always ask to be escalated to a human or if it gets realized that it's too complicated for the bot, it will go to a human. But I guess compared to healthcare, all these other scenarios in like travel or support or retail are just so much easier to, to automate. It's, yeah, we may, we, I mean, I, I want to believe at some point we'll get there. It just, just feels like it's inevitable. We'll get to some place where, where a lot of it can be automated, but it just feels very far away. Not just from a tech point of view, but from a safety point mm -hmm. of view. Safety um, and adaption, totally agree. But yeah, I think that's actually one of my like mini dreams is like, is there a way to seamlessly kind of start a conversation with a bot, but then like pull in the human, like tap yeah. in the human? I mean, the patient should know when, when it happens, but it mm -hmm. should feel seamless as they go through. And again, we're not even close to that yet, or I haven't seen anybody really be able to pull that off. Right. And if it's like as a patient, you'd probably be open to it because access may still be very difficult right now. And so you trade off, you know, your, your preferred experience with instant access. I think a lot of folks would gravitate towards, well, I'd rather get some part of Dr. Sakumoto faster than, than waiting, right? So, Actually, Matt, I wanted to ask you about telehealth literacy. So, you know, now that there is all these digital modalities of reaching patients, there's um, another issue that arises, which is education with clinicians and how do we actually convey digital empathy and we need to communicate that to them. So there's this growing need for telehealth literacy. I'm curious, what have you found to be effective in training clinicians on how to communicate digitally? Yeah, uh, I think a lot of it, the nice thing that I think that I've seen is like, there's a recognition of like, oh, this is different. Like that this is harder or like I want to learn. So that actually just intrinsic motivation to learn has been nice. And yeah, I've given lectures slash, and most of these things, nothing, none of it's rocket science. A lot of it is just that, that whole thing of more is more. So that, that, that need to over communicate, you know, things that may have landed easily in a room. When you're in the room with a patient, you kind of have to like say twice or, you know, do again. But yeah, I've, I've given, so that one thing I said, a lot of both companies and individual clinicians have recognized that this is something that they want to learn more about. So I think that's, I've done sort of a lecture circuit on, on, on that. But I think the other thing too is it's constantly changing. As patients experience telehealth, you know, particularly video visits more, their expectation of what a doc can handle virtually also starts to rise. Yeah. So I think there are specific example I'll give is if you had asked me, I guess at this point, three years ago, so pre-COVID, can you do a respiratory concern over video? I'd be like, of course not. You have yeah. to listen to the lungs. Like you can, you need to listen for wheezing. Like clearly everyone's done like the COVID, you know, visual exam. You you ask the patient, are you short of breath? Like you you use a lot more patient based, patient reported signs and symptoms. So clearly our views of both patient expectation and clinician expectations can change. So I think that's just going to be a, a constantly moving and probably improving target of what people can handle virtually. Matt, can I ask you, when you talk to new graduates who are coming to practice for the first time, you know, after 2020, how popular is virtual first care right now among new grads? Is it, is it just like skyrocketing right now or are most folks still not really comfortable yet? Cause they didn't, they weren't really necessarily fully trained in that approach coming out of, of of you know residency or fellowship yeah i'd say it's more of the latter unfortunately i thought for sure the kind of they would be like everyone would i mean almost everybody like you know, had to virtualize their clinic during COVID, right so a lot of people got exposure to it i think the embeddedness of virtual care skills both physical you know virtual physical exam skills as well as digital empathy and communication skills have not quite made it into formal medical student or residency training curriculum. A couple of places are doing it, but like it's not widespread. So what I thought, so in my mind, so if you had asked me this at 2021, 
I thought that telehealth was going to be a little more like the uh, ubiquitous, like the EHR, where you would have to say, like, okay, everyone has to kind of learn how to navigate, talk and type, put in orders on a computer. And and that part's true. I think like, like I remember even for me in medical school, that was EHR training, even like how to like position yourself so you're typing and while keeping eye contact with the patient were, were things that we formally learned. So that's kind of the ubiquitousness of the EHR. I thought telehealth was going to go that way. Telehealth feels like it's going a little more focused, like a point of care ultrasound realm where those that want to do it can get credentialed in it. There are formal fellowships around where people can kind of take coursework to, to learn how to do it, but it's going to be separate. Like it, it's, it, I think not everybody's going to necessarily, there's going to be like a baseline skill. Like can you turn on zoom? Can yeah. you do a visit maybe once a week with a patient? But I think like that virtualist thing or is going to be more of a subset and not a ubiquitous piece. At least that's kind of the way I see things uh, separating and shaking out these days. Are, are there certain like market forces or features and arrows that have to happen, do you think, to make virtual first care more common or, or more attractive to, to, to clinicians? Yeah. I mean, I think the two, I'm just kind of thinking back at like some of the commercial telehealth places that I was working at, the camps fell into two, two very bimodal camps. It was like a large amount of like newish grads, you know, doctors somewhere between one and six years out of residency training. And then like a lot of late stage career docs. Right. Uh, so like they've been in practice for like 20, 35 years, kind of got tired of schlepping it into clinic every day, but wanted to continue to do some sort of patient care thing and they're able to do it from home. So I think that's, there, there'll be sort of this like workforce retention lifestyle balance piece okay. that will keep the, some portion of people going into telehealth uh, in way, shape or form. So and, and maybe we're getting into it ever ourselves, but you know, with the concerns around workforce shortage and, you know, clinicians, you know, leaving healthcare, like I, I've heard stats where something like 70% of physicians now would not recommend the career to, to their children. If potentially this could be a way to keep more folks in healthcare, in medicine, by giving them a little bit more flexibility and balance, that might be a really important part of the toolkit for, for tackling the workforce shortage. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I think so. I mean, in the one for like, I'm a outpatient primary care doc, um, but even on the inpatient side, like this idea of a virtual hospitalist EICU is a big thing, right? So rather than having to be away from your family and sleep on a cot in the hospital, can you, I mean, you're on call, which is still not great, but like, can you, can you at least be on call, sleep in your own bed, but then still actually have the higher fidelity, you know, video visit, have a nurse telepresent the patient to you or have a hospitalist that's on site telepresent the patient to you. So I think there are just lifestyle, work-life integration things that can be improved with the, the the virtual care piece. So yeah, I'm I'm optimistic that 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 can kind of and again I've seen it right like a large parts of the workforce that one of the telehealth places I was working at was later stage uh, later career physicians that kind of wanted to keep practicing without having to go into the office. I think that's one way to keep people in the game a little longer. Yeah. That. So I got a wacky question for you now, because your comment about the, the EICU just inspired a thought. So you you know how like in, in, in the hospital, so, like some places have these robots that, I mean, you call them robots, basically it's like it, it moves around into the patient rooms and maybe the physician is, you know, brought in on video so that you can see the patient in the room and they can see the physician's face and all that. Have you heard of cases where house calls to patients homes are being done that way where you know, more than just, you know, you're on a Zoom, but like literally like a robot's coming into the, the patient's home. And I don't know if that really makes a difference in any way, because it's not like you're doing a physical exam as a robot, but but maybe you're closer to the patient or you can see more of the surroundings and, and in some ways it's more useful. But I'm curious, have you ever heard, heard of that? Where like a robot goes into to do a house call and then you're kind of videoed in as a physician. I don't know if that actually exists or if it's useful or not. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the, I had not even thought about that case. You're, you're, you're the, the, in, the in-house hospital, sorry, the, the in-hospital case you're talking about is kind of like an iPad on a stick, right? Where you sort of <laughs> yeah, have, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're a robot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Short answer is no. And I think for the most part, there's like not a large need for it. I, I <laughs> will say on, on the house call piece, I really like the fact that I can do house calls with my patients virtually, right? Like there's Here. so much more that you learn and you see them in their context can you hear their kids screaming in the background and you fully understand like, okay, I understand why your stress is through the roof and why I need to titrate your medicines up a little bit. So like there's levels of seeing the patient in their element. That's very different than when you see a patient come into your office. So I think bringing back that house call piece is, has, has been a great part of telehealth and empathy building, right? You kind of understand like where they're at. 
but the need to have, I think for a routine visit, no. I wonder if there are ways of combating like the loneliness epi epidemic, higher, you know, the geriatric population, older patients, does having a more anthropomorphic thing help build that connection or not? That's a good question. I'm also just thinking, I'm, I'm overly practical, but it's like the thought of like having to toss that robot in the trunk and move it from place to place <laughs> that better or worse than being able to just carry it. <laughs> it's going to move itself. It's true. Oh, that's true. It can, it can drive itself. That's true. It, it, it'll drive itself in a self-driving car and go from place right. to place. You know, we, we may have solved uh, a lot of there. <laughs> there might be something there. Oh, that's awesome. Not that too, like a, it's a, basically, it's sort of the drone. It flies itself right. there and it's a transformer as well. So it turns into a, <laughs> A patient-friendly house call robot. There we go. That's, that's the business right there. <laughs> Love it. Now, so, that we're over-engineering something that apparently a video visit is, is well <laughs> suited. Perfectly I mean, fine. So, what I will say is, like, actually for all patients, older, age-independent, is mobile devices have fully unlocked a lot of these things, too. Right? Like, this was, like, not possible before when, like, smartphone ownership was not as high. But, like, even grandparents have, if not a smartphone, so many of them like FaceTime with their grandkids. So oh. like they have some sort of video enabled device in their home. So the ability to yeah, do outreach and and like the ubiquity of, of a lot of just handheld mobile devices uh, in, in the home really unlocks a lot of the access pieces. Yeah, totally. But, but robots are still fun. So yeah, I'm... <laughs> I'm, I'm... <laughs> That's awesome. So Matt, just being mindful of your time, we're going to flip over to the fast five lightning rounds. Five quick questions to get to know you better. Uh, first question that we have is, what is your favorite book or book you've gifted the most? Yeah, I feel the one I go back to is Drive by Daniel Pink. There's a lot of, I guess large parts of like being a primary care doc is motivating patients. It's like, what is that motivational piece? And then even just reflecting back now as we start to build like a new model of care, how do you motivate staff and kind of get people on board with a new idea, retain staff and things like <laughs> that. It's Drive by Daniel Pink. Book is quite good. The TED Talk on YouTube also actually summarizes the book quite nicely, so mm -hmm. would recommend. Yeah, I love it. Question two, who is a person either dead or alive you'd love to meet? I know, I'm bummed we didn't get to talk about some of the music stuff. So big music fan, I play trumpet and guitar, but there's a trumpeter. Miles Davis is like the, the go-to yeah. answer just because he's like so famous and has gone through so many different things. But the one person that I'd actually want to talk to more, also jazz trumpeter, Clifford Brown. He was one of those like died at an early age, but like was so prolific on the front end. So it's that level of I guess musically for me, at least, it's like level of like technicality and creativity together was like super impressive. And like I said, he wasn't, he died in a car crash. It wasn't like the usual <laughs> drug overdose or kind of the partying that the um, <laughs> other musicians were doing. So there's this level of like a life cut too short. And just again, that level of creativity, um, virtuosity is impressive. And again, that, that music side of me really resonates with. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Question four, or sorry, question three. Would you rather have super strength, super speed, or the ability to read people's minds? Oh, I know. I watch too much Marvel, so I'm like thinking of like the different like what superhero do I most vibe with? I'd probably go the super speed. I think there's okay. levels of super strength. I don't know. I'll only get brute strength only gets you so far. Ability to read people's minds. I feel like actually again going back to that digital empathy thing. There's a lot of just like intuiting and things yeah. that like again. So there's for me i like building that skills so if i had automatic mind reading ability that would make that less fun so i think it's the super speed part that's sort of i'm also very into hyper efficiency so right. the faster i can get from yeah. point a to b i'm about the super speed yep no, i like the reasoning question four what is something in healthcare you believe that others might find insane i'm actually i'm curious to see if this is actually an insane thought or not this i was i thought a lot about this question i was like i think if we could get rid of 80% of hospitals, 80% of hospitals, I think, definitely in the U.S., maybe if not worldwide, could go away. Sure. I think most of the things, again, I'm highly virtual-minded, but I'm okay being less hospital-centric and just like if 80 of them disappeared, it would be all right. I mean, to be fair, like if if we did a better job at preventive and, and primary and you know public health care, theoretically, you shouldn't need as many hospitals. I don't know how many you could eliminate, but... And and the yeah. eighty number was I, I I lived my life by the eighty twenty rule, so it's like I feel like eighty percent of them. <laughs> so that 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 number was purely based on my 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 personal guiding light and not any actual data. <laughs> yeah, 
Awesome. Last question. I'm actually going to change it up. So you mentioned you played trumpet and guitar growing up. I know you started Music Matters Med, which was a, a nonprofit back in the day. I think you played music at the bedside for patients live music, which is really awesome. So the last question that I have is, do you have uh, or can you share more on how that initiative started? And do you have a memory from that time? Yeah. And I think this really, I'm actually trying to remember how it started specifically, but it was definitely through like a patient partnership. And that's kind of how I've loved uh, even all the digital empathy work I do. I, I, I partner with a patient advocate. So one, I definitely wanted to get back to playing trumpet and guitar. Trumpet is also doable in the hospital with a mute. So I've done it. Mm -hmm. It was mostly guitar though. Yeah. And it was just this idea that actually I do remember in doing, during my medical school rotation, you realize that like the morning rounds time is super busy. Like there's just like you're seeing the patient, you're putting in orders, you're getting, you're calling consults, you're doing all these things. The afternoon is just like dead time and the patients are bored out of their minds. So kind of from that like 2 p.m. till like nursing shift change around 7 p.m. Patients are so bored. So I think that was like what I realized was like a good time to kind of circle back. So it's myself, a couple of friends that sang and played other instruments. So we sort of started doing music rounds. So it was like the kind of taking that parallel between the two. So that was bringing it to the bedside in the hospital, I think was a was a was a big difference, and then you realize just like how much time and connection, yeah, that, that that you can create create with patients there. And then yeah, we would we would round like it wasn't daily, but it would be like a, a couple times, a couple times, a uh, couple times a week. And I guess one memory that I had, and it's, it's funny because it's like you you think that this is just like a hobby of sorts, but I had gotten, I don't think I was paid. I must have just been texted. But like there was a patient that I'd gotten to know over the course of time playing and then their mother was like passing away or like was, was kind of go going under hospice. So they asked it, could I come? It's like, oh, I know like you usually come and play on like Thursdays, but it's Monday and we're families here. Like, could you come by? I was like, okay. So it's one of those things where it's good. You realize like that level of connection that you can do. I was like, I've never been paged to play music before, but that was a semi-urgent page that again was able to kind of see both the patient and their family. So oh, that's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. it is. No, that's really awesome. Do you just, we have a, a minute left, but I was yeah. curious, do you think you could, it's possible to replicate that type of experience digitally? Like, I know we were talking about the the cameras with the physicians, like, is it going to be something like that or? Oh, we, we totally did actually. So this wasn't me. There was when I was at um, Music Matters Med, I did when I was at Northwestern as a medical student um, during COVID at, at UCSF, there was actually a bunch of high school kids that would play Zoom. So the nurses would set up, I think it was an iPad. So we had iPads, again, patients were isolated a lot of, you know, visitor restrictions. So they already had iPads set up for family members to call in to say hi to the right. patients. So we basically commandeered one of those. And then I think like once a week, there was like an entire, so the, again, points to the um, high school student that put this together. I kind of just helped facilitate some of this, but yeah, uh, they, they, they virtualized, they did virtual, virtual concerts on the medicine floor, COVID, COVID floor, basically <laughs> for patients that were there. And it was like all manner of stuff. There were like kids that were playing like bought concertos on cellos like it was a full whatever i was doing on like just a guitar they were doing like <laughs> very impressive um, to be uh, fair you probably couldn't bring a cello into the patient room it'd been a probably very difficult so you know not like you could right yeah <laughs> but they had they would have like four or five like separate performances like different different performers well, that, that would do it over um, the course of like an hour an hour and a half so 100 percent, both theoretically and practically nice. virtualizable. wow that's awesome well, amazing, Matt. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. For folks listening, you can find Matt on Twitter at Matt Sakamoto, S-A-K-U-M-O-T-O. -O. And that's a wrap for this episode of The Digital Patient hosted by SeamlessMD. You can follow us on Twitter at SeamlessMD. And if you like the podcast and you want to learn more, you can visit www.seamless.md. Matt, again, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. You have a ton of wisdom in this realm of digital health that I think everybody is really fascinated by and can learn a lot from. So thanks so much. Thank you. It was a great time.